we, we discussed last week whether I was going to have a Mother's Day message or continue our study in the book of Revelation. And as you can see, we're going on to Revelation chapter 13. <laughs> but you know, this is not totally diverse um, from a Mother's Day message. It's not a message about mothers, uh, but there is a thought here for mothers. And that is what we're going to see in Revelation chapter 13 is what began back in the early part of the book of Genesis, chapter 1, 1 through 3 there, where there has been a war between God and Satan over a war between God and Satan over who has the right to be worshipped. And Satan wants, has from the beginning wanted to usurp the authority of God, Isaiah 14. He decided he would be like the Most High. He wanted to overthrow God, and he would be the one that would be worshipped. And he's going to accomplish that in Revelation chapter 13. But it's only a short time. Jesus Christ will come back and rule and reign and be worshipped as God in this world. Um, so anyhow, the, there's been a battle from the very beginning, and it's going to come to a head in the book of Revelation. And the victory is going to be uh, God the Father and God the Son. But the point is, is that you need to realize that we live in a world that we're just playing out that war, not being manipulated by God, but certainly being manipulated by Satan, and that there is a battle for your children. And it is important for mothers to realize what's the most important thing you can pass on to your children, and that is to know the truth about who Jesus Christ is, what he accomplished when he went to the cross and died and paid for our sins to give us the gift of eternal life, that eternal life is an eternal purpose God has for mankind, and only those who have trust Jesus Christ as our Savior uh, are those that are going to fulfill God's purpose for mankind. The rest are going to be discarded in a lake of fire. And, and so uh, there's a battle for the souls of men, especially the souls of your children. And among all the, all the responsibilities of a parent, and especially a mother today, uh, would be to guide your children into the truth of God's word and realize what life is really all about because it's going to come to an end physically in our life if, if we live until before and die, if we die before the Lord comes uh, it's the purpose of our life but the Lord is eventually going to come and fulfill his purpose in this earth and that will be the new heaven and new earth so anyhow Revelation chapter 13 let me point out the events that are going to take place here Revelation 13, verse 1 says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his, his heads the name of blasphemy. And, and, the, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leper, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I pray that as we go into this book of Revelation and John describes some things to us that are, are somewhat obscure, uh, the, the comparison of scriptures and the study of the verses, that we can understand what these things are and pray that we will have basic understanding and perhaps even advanced understanding as we look at these events that are described to us in Revelation chapter 13. And we pray this in the Savior's name. Amen. Last week when we studied Revelation chapter 12, we saw that Satan is cast out of heaven. And when he's cast out of heaven, chapter 12 and verse 7 says this, And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels, and that's Michael the archangel, uh, fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And, and once he's cast out of heaven, he then goes after the nation of Israel, because God's going to bring his kingdom to this earth through the nation of Israel. So Satan's goal will be to wipe out the nation of Israel, especially the believing remnant of Israel, because the unbelieving part of the nation is already deceived by him and is following him. So he's going to go after them. But I read that to you to remind you who this dragon is. It's Satan himself that is cast out of heaven down to the earth. When we get to Revelation chapter 13, we now have Satan on the earth, but we're introduced to a beast. In fact, I'll just show you ahead of time. In verse 1 of Revelation 13, it says, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. 
And that beast, we, we generally call him the Antichrist. The book of Revelation actually calls him the beast. We'll see why in just a second. But if you look at verse 11, now that's verses 1 through 10 will describe that beast that comes out of the sea. When you come to verse 11, it says, And I beheld, I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. And he had two horns like, uh, like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So there's a second beast, one that comes out of the earth. And, and there'll be another figure that's going to show up because they're going to create an image of the beast. And that's part of this as well. But these two beasts rise up. And one's out of the sea and one's out of the earth. And there's details about what they're going to do in this earth. So the first is, is to talk about the beast that rises up out of the sea. When you study your Bible, the symbolism, when you talk about the sea, in Israel's day you had that Mediterranean Sea, and it was like the Roman Empire was built around the Mediterranean Sea there. So what we're talking about is out of the nations, the Gentile nations, a beast is going to rise up. And, and he's going to have power. It says in verse 2, it says, And the beast that I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet like the feet of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. He has power, he has a seat, and that seat is a kingdom, a, a kingship, and great authority. He has authority, as you're going to read on later, he uh, has authority over all the earth. So this is the one that we call the Antichrist that's rising up. And he has the, the power, the seat, and the great authority because of the dragon that's working behind the scene. And that dragon, we already know from Revelation chapter 12, is Satan. Now, I want to say some things about verse 1, but before I do, hold your place in Revelation and come to Daniel chapter 7. Anytime someone teaches the book of Revelation, it's always good to go over the book of Daniel first. Because Daniel is taken captive by the first Gentile power. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took over the nation of Israel. Israel is supposed to be a kingdom that's going to bring God's kingdom on this earth. But because they turned to idolatry, God gave them over to the hands of the Gentiles. And there'll be Gentile powers that will rule over the nation of Israel until Jesus Christ comes back and destroys those powers. In, Revel, in Daniel, now you, I got you in Revel, Daniel chapter 7, but in Daniel chapter 2, when Nebuchadnezzar became a great power, God gave him a vision, and Daniel interpreted that vision, and that is, Nebuchadnezzar was wondering, I'm so great, I got control over the whole earth, what happens after me? And the, the revelation was given to him that he is the first Gentile power. After him will be the Medes and Persian Empire. After that will be the Grecian Empire. And then there'll be a fourth kingdom. Now the fourth kingdom sometimes is referred to as Rome. If it's Rome, Rome got interrupted by the Age of Grace and will ultimately continue in the future as sometimes people call it the revived Roman Empire. But it will be called the Antichrist Kingdom. Uh, some people actually take Rome and make it part of Greece and then make the fourth kingdom the Antichrist kingdom. What's important for you to see is that fourth kingdom is going to be the Antichrist kingdom that we're reading about in Revelation chapter 13. So you're in, you're in Daniel chapter 7, and let me point this out to you. In verse 3, it says, uh, Daniel, this is in fact Daniel's first vision himself. He's been interpreting other visions, but this is the first one he has himself. And it says in verse 3, the four great beasts, he has a vision about four beasts, came up out of the sea, diverse one from another. And he starts describing the four beasts that come out of the sea. We're not going to study each one, but watch this. Verse 4 says, the first was like a lion. Verse 5 says, and behold, another beast, the second, like unto a bear. And verse 6, after this I beheld, and lo, uh, another like a leopard. Do you see the lion, the bear, the leopard? If you look at Daniel, uh, Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2, the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and he's going backwards here, and his feet the feet of a, of a bear, and his mouth the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and seat and great authority. So that's matching the, those four beasts that rise up out of the sea. When you get to Daniel chapter, uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 7, it says, After this, after he saw the leopard and the, 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 the bear and the lion, he said, After this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And he had great iron teeth, and it devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet, 
and was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. So what we're talking about here is the fourth beast conquered the other three Gentile powers and became diverse and greater, exceedingly powerful. And that's the Antichrist kingdom. It's going to be the fourth kingdom on this earth, but we're not talking about Rome, we're talking about the Antichrist kingdom that's yet future to our day. And, and he devours those other, but he becomes that Gentile power in the last days. Notice it ends in verse 7 by saying, he had ten horns. Now, hold your place still in Daniel 7, but flip back over to, Daniel, uh, to Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation 12, when we were introduced to Satan in the heavens, it said in verse 3, Revelation 12 and verse 3, and there appeared, oh, I should do something here. There's an artist's rendition of that last creature. There's four different kind of animals all built into one. That's a, render, uh, uh, a rendering of that uh, artist way. Uh, but anyhow, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3 says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his head. Now, what I want you to point out, I get a little confused myself in, in talking about this, but just notice that it ends where the dragon, which is Satan, has seven crowns upon his head. But when we get to Revelation chapter 13, after Satan is cast out of heaven, he's down to earth, and he gives this beast this great power and authority. Notice in verse 1 of Revelation 13, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horn ten crowns, and upon his head the name of blasphemy. So all of a sudden now we went from seven crowns to ten crowns. And how did he gain the other three crowns. Well, Satan's cast out of heaven. By the time the beast rises up, he's got ten crowns. And those ten crowns are described to us, if we go back to Daniel chapter 7, he had the, verse 7 ends of Daniel 7, ends he had ten horns. And those horns represent those ten crowns. But it says in verse 8, And I considered the horns, and Behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom the three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and his mouth, the mouth speaking great things. So he beholds those horns, and notice there's ten crowns, and that would represent ten different kings. So I got the kings on the bottom, the crowns on the top. Those crowns represent the kingdoms that these ten kings control. But again, verse seven, uh, verse 8 says, And I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. So, there comes up among them another little horn. That little horn is going to be the Antichrist. So you had those ten kings, but among them comes one that's called the little horn. And when that little horn comes up, it says, Before whom were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Come over to verse 23. In verse 23, the angel is now telling Daniel the interpretation to what he is seeing. And he says in verse uh, 24, no, verse 23, it says, And thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and shall subdue three kings. And so if you got that one, and he subdues three kings, now you got seven horns, and but you got ten crowns there. You have ten king. Uh, you got seven kings, but he's ruling ten different nations because the one arose and conquered three others, and and so that's what it's describing here. At least that's how I depict it in this. In verse twenty-five says, "And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and wear out the saints of the Most High." and think to change times and laws 
and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and dividing of times. A dividing of a time is a half. So it's time singular, times plural, so that's singular and plural, that's three and a half a time, three and a half years. This one is going to rise up, he's going to conquer those three, and when he conquers those three, he thinks he's going to cha change times, laws, and season. He thinks he's going to outdo what God says is going to be done. He thinks he's going to have the authority to rule over this earth and, and have his kingdom last forever. He's speaking great swelling things, it says. Verse 26 says, And the judgment was set, and they, were taken, uh, and they shall take away his dominion, and consume and destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given unto the people of the saints of the Most High. That is God's kingdom people, the believing remnant of the nation of Israel and those that followed Israel, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey Him. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan thinks he's going to override, but Jesus Christ is going to consume him, destroy him, and set up his kingdom with his people. Verse 28, hitherto is the end of the matter. And I don't need to read any more. <laughs> because ultimately, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have victory over this little horn who rises up, where you have these seven uh, kings now uh, ruling over ten different kingdoms, and the Antichrist is that little horn that's got the power to a uh, seat and great authority that we're reading about in Revelation chapter 13. So go back to Revelation 13. So we saw what 1 and 2 is, and, and Daniel interprets it for us, or the angel interprets it for Daniel for us to understand. Verse 3 says, of, De of Revelation 13, And I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So this one who rises up and has great authority, he has a deadly wound in the head there. It says, in one of his heads, as it were, had a deadly, uh, uh, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. If you have, if you're wounded unto death, it looks like you're, there's no hope. Like you're de something, either assassination, some way, shot in the head or something where he's going to die. But then he has a deadly wound, but he comes back from that deadly wound, as if he died and rose again. And, uh, and then when, once that takes place, it, it says, uh, and the world, uh, it, it says, and the world wondered after the beast. They're in wonder, they're in amazement. This one right before their eyes who, who took control of all the kingdoms of the world dies and then comes alive again, and the world starts wondering after him following him, and not only following him, verse 4, and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. They're worshipping Satan. You know, in Revelation, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul makes it clear that the idols that the Gentiles worship, they worship unto devils. When you look at that, when it says they worship the dragon, I'm not sure they realize they're worshipping Satan. This beast is giving credit to his, the power behind him, the spiritual being behind him, which is Satan. And so the world starts worshiping the spiritual being behind the beast. They're worshiping Satan. Now whether they know that at this point or not, but they not only worship the, the power behind the beast, they worship the beast. It says, verse 4, And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? They're realizing this guy has power over life. And, uh, and so they're realizing how amazing uh, this person is. And they're following him, worshiping him. It's a spiritual thing. I want you to hold your place here because this is real important. And, and come to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I've got to see where my pictures are. No, where that's what, getting ahead of ourselves, okay. 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul gives us great detail. The Thessalonians were thinking that the persecution, and they're Christians who are going through persecution, that they're living in the last times. And uh, the, Paul's explaining to them that they're not living in the last times. Look at verse 3. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. What I want you to realize is that when the Antichrist shows up, Paul gives him two titles. And, and when he, it, 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 so Paul's telling the Thessalonians, you're not living in this time right now. We live in the dispensation of grace. But there's going to be a time where there's going to be a falling away, a departure from the truth. And when the departure from the truth takes place, the man of sin is going to be revealed. But he also calls him the son of perdition. And what we're seeing over there in Revelation chapter 13 is the different two titles of that. The man of sin is a human being that becomes the political, we call him the Antichrist, the political leader of the world, taking over the kingdoms of this earth. He is that, that little horn that rised up. He's a man. He's the man of sin because he's actually indwelt or controlled by Satan. But not only that, when he dies and he goes through this death and comes back alive, I'm going to point out to you that he is now energized by Satan himself. And he goes from being the man of sin to the son of perdition. Now there's only one other person called the son of perdition. Now wait, before I leave there, instead of bringing you back to Thessalonians later on, let me cover some things that Paul says about this. He, in verses 5 through 8 here, he's going to explain what's holding back the man of sin is the dispensation of grace. Now I'm not going to explain that to you, but he does say in verse 7, the mystery of iniquity does already work. And that is, Satan is already at work today, but he just hasn't got his way yet. But when the age of grace is over, and it's going to end with a rapture where the believer is going to be taken out of this earth, and when we're taken out of this earth, then we pick up in verse 8, where it says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So there comes the Antichrist, and Jesus Christ will destroy him. But when the Antichrist shows up, look at verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness, all deceivable. He's going to have every means possible to deceive people. This, this one is going to, he's going to come with lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We live in the dispensation of grace today where the message today is a message of salvation through the cross of Christ. And this world just ignores that, that Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for their sins and God wants to give them eternal life as a free gift because Jesus Christ paid it all and the only thing you can do once something's totally paid for is just receive it as a gift and you receive it on the basis of faith but the world, the world doesn't love the truth that they might be saved. So when you get into that tribulation and that Antichrist shows up, God is going to allow him to have all deceivableness. He's going to have lying wonders. He's going to be able to do miracles in order to deceive the people on this earth so that the people of this earth will be damned because they didn't want Jesus Christ. So God's going to give them over to the Antichrist. That's a dangerous thing, isn't it? To ignore the gift of God today, to ignore His Son, to turn your back on the gift of eternal life and think that, well, my friends used to tell me when I, I was sharing the gospel when I was in high school, but my friends used to, I tell them about the rapture. You know what they always said to me? Well, if someday you disappear from this earth, I'll trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. And no, no, you won't. If I disappear from this earth, God's going to send strong delusion that you'll believe a lie, that you might be damned because you didn't love the truth. I didn't quite know it that way then, but, <laughs> but that's used to what they used to say to me. So anyhow, that's, that's, Paul tells us about those events, those events. And, and what, what Satan's goal is, is to be worshipped. Look back at verse 4. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 
That's what the Antichrist wants to do. He wants the worship that's due to God, and he's going to cause the world to bow down and worship him. What Paul's describing in verse 4 is what Matthew 24 calls the abomination of desolation, quoting Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. The abomination of desolation has to do with setting up an, uh, an image in the temple and worshiping that image as God, and that image is going to be the image of the Antichrist. Now we're going to see that. This is all ahead of time of what's coming up in Revelation chapter 13. So Paul informs us about all those details. But I told you, there's only one other person in the Bible called the man of sin. Come back with me to John, or no, excuse me, called the son of perdition. Come back to John chapter 17, the book of John. And then we'll get back to Revelation after that. John chapter 17. Now this is Jesus Christ praying he knows he's going to die and go back to heaven and leave the 12 apostles in charge. And so he's praying for the 12 apostles and their ministry. All I want, to see, all I want you to see is verse 12. As he's praying to God the Father, John chapter 17 verse 12 says, while, he was yet with them in, well, while I was yet with them in the world, that Jesus Christ talking to God the Father, I, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gave, gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Out of the twelve apostles, which one did the Lord lose? He lost Judas. And that's, he's calling him the son of perdition. That's what the Antichrist is called. The man of sin, the son of perdition. And, and that's Satan. But why, why would the Antichrist be called the son of perdition? We'll just flip back to chapter uh, 13 of John. And this is where Satan, I'm uh, Satan, this is where Judas betrays Christ. John chapter 13, verse 21, it says, And when, when, G, when Jesus had the, uh, thus said, He was troubled in the spirit, and testified, and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, one of you shall betray me. So he's preparing them, and they're trying to figure out which one it is. We won't go through all those details. Look at verse 26. It says, Jesus answered, He that is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And that is, that's the one who's going to betray me. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Jesus said unto, uh, then said Jesus unto him, that thou doest, do quickly. So he's called the son of perdition because Satan entered into Judas. And now we're over here in Revelation chapter 13, realizing that this man of sin goes through, has a deadly wound, and all of a sudden seems to come back alive again. What gives him that life? Satan entering into him. He went from the man of sin, and he becomes now the son of perdition. Satan has energized the, this, this man's body. And that's where we pick up in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5. It says, Revelation 13, 5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. How long is forty two months? Three and a half years. <laughs> and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. See, he's saying he's God, and now he's blaspheming the God of heaven. Watch what he does. To blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Well, that's what we saw in chapter 12. He's going to go after the nation of Israel, the believing remnant. And he says, given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given unto him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. He's going to become a one world dictator. And, and it says, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Uh, if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. And that is, there's going to, he's going after the saints. There's going to, some of them are going to die by the sword. And, and certainly if you don't take the mark of the beast, you're going to be 
die by, the, by be, being headed, and that's coming up later in the chapter. But here, this is the patience and faith of the saints. The patience, they're going to wait for Jesus Christ, they're not going to worship this Antichrist. And as a result of that, they might have to die for their faith. It's a lot different being saved in the tribulation than being saved in the dispensation of grace, isn't it? Where today you just simply trust what Jesus Christ did on the cross, and God gives you eternal life as a free gift the moment you believe. Seals you with the Holy Spirit, you belong to Him, you're His. But in the tribulation, the believer is going to have to endure to the end. Not take that mark of the beast that's coming up in this chapter. And so they have to have patience and faith of the saints. And at the end, verse 10 is describing there will be justice in the earth when Jesus Christ comes back. But until then, Satan is going to come and he's going to have power over all the kindreds, tongues, and nations. Now, that's, the, that's that beast. When you come over to verse 11, now we can introduce this one. You have a second beast that's being talked about. And it says, and I behold, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns, and he spake, uh, he had, had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Well, first of all, the first beast came out of the sea. So he came, came out of the nations, like out of the Gentile nations. The second beast comes out of the land. And when you think of the land, you think of the land of Israel. And I don't know for sure, but you wonder if this beast is a Jew. But he, he, he comes out of the, he comes out, out of the lamb, uh, comes, out of the, comes out of the land, and when it describes him, he had two horns like a lamb. When you say like a lamb, Jesus Christ is the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. But this guy rises up out of the land, and he has two horns like a lamb, and he's like a lamb. He, everything you read about the Antichrist, like Peter talks about, Satan as a roaring lion walketh about. He counterfeits everything that's true about Jesus Christ. So this guy, he's going to look like Jesus Christ. He looks like a lamb, but he's going to speak as a dragon. Who's the dragon? The devil. Come over to Revelation chapter 19. Now this is after Jesus Christ comes back. Verse 20, I want, to sh I want to show you these two verses. So Jesus Christ comes back, and in verse 20 it says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which deceived them that received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped the image. These both were cast alive into the lake of, uh, the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The, the first beast... The second beast is called, in this verse, the false prophet. He's going to speak like a dragon. He's not speaking the words of Jesus Christ. He looks like Jesus Christ, but the words coming out of his mouth is the words of the devil. And it's, they're going to cause the people of this earth to worship Satan. And so the beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire. Come up after a thousand years after that, look at verse, chapter 20, verse 10. It says, and the devil that deceived them were cast into the lake, uh, the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So eventually, a thousand years later, Satan is going to join the beast and the false prophet in that lake of fire. So we're over here in Revelation chapter 13. We've been, been introduced to the first beast. The, the, what we call the Antichrist, the political figure. But when we come to verse 11, now we're coming to a false prophet. Someone who's supposed to be like a spiritual man, who is going to prophesy. And what he's going to do, watch what happens here. In verse 11 it says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the sea, and he had two horns like a lamb, and uh, spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. So he calls, calls them all to worship that beast. Now, at this point in our study, there's three figures that we're talking about. We know the dragon is involved in both the first beast and the second beast. We know that dragon is Satan. He is the spiritual power behind the scene that no one can see. Then there's the first beast, he is the Antichrist. He is the one that's going to be king over all the earth. And then we have this, this second beast who is a false prophet. 
He's speaking lies. He's causing the world to worship the beast. Well, what you're looking at is called the unholy trinity. God the Father is the, the, God, the, the power behind all things that you don't see God the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ is God who came in flesh. And he is the one that's going to set up his kingdom, the kingdom of God, on this earth. When the Holy Spirit is poured out, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to point people to Jesus Christ and to worship him. Now I'm pointing to that, but I shouldn't be pointing to that. <laughs> but you can see the counterfeit here. As this false prophet is telling people to worship the beast, the true Holy Spirit of God, the true Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to give us God's word, the word of Jesus Christ, and to cause the world to worship Jesus Christ. But Satan has his own counterfeit religion going on here, starting with that second beast. Now, we pick up in verse 13. It says, And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of all men, and deceived them, deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Now, before I finish that verse, didn't, we, didn't Paul just tell us God's going to give this, this person all power, lying wonders, to deceive the people of the earth? They don't want Jesus Christ, so they're going to end up worshiping the beast. And they're going to worship the dragon that's behind the beast. They're going to worship Satan. Satan thinks he's going to have his way, but God is allowing it to happen so that they all might be damned who didn't want Jesus Christ. And, and so that's what's taking place here. And the very fact that he has this power, one of the things to think about is when Moses went to lead Israel out of Egypt, God gave Moses three miracles. And do you remember when he went, the magicians in Egypt were able to du duplicate those miracles, at least about the first five? And you wonder, how did they do the same miracles? If God gave miracles to Moses, how did those guys do the miracle? Well, Pharaoh didn't want to believe Moses was sent by God. So he told his magicians, you do it. They cast it down, they did it. I bet you they were shocked as, as, as we are that they could do it. <laughs> because God hardened Pharaoh's heart because he didn't want to believe Moses. So he said, okay, let those guys do miracles. He couldn't du duplicate all the miracles, but he du duplicated some of them. So that's exactly what's going on here at the end in, in the tribulation. In the last three and a half years, as the First beast shows up and the second beast shows up and he has all these powers to do these miracles. Verse 14 again, it says, And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. I perhaps should say this. We live in the dispensation of grace where God is not doing miracles today. Now, people think that's blasphemy, but it's not. God has given us the Bible to go by. Our faith is in the Word of God, not in watching someone do miracles. We got all kinds of people being trained in Christian churches today to look for signs and wonders, look for miracles, look for healing, look for someone raising from the dead. And they're teaching people not to trust the Bible, but to look for miracles, and that's going to fall right into the hands of the Antichrist someday when the world thinks, oh, when you see a miracle, that's God. No, it's not. So anyhow, that's a warning because people today think God is doing these things today. He's not. He did it in Israel's day because as we're studying the book of Luke, those were signs of the kingdom coming. The kingdom has been postponed for 2,000 years. Today we live by the word of God. Anyhow, again, verse 14. He deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of the miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying unto them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which was wounded by, uh, wounded by the sword and did live. You know, I should just tell you, because I don't have time to turn back there, Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17, will describe the deadly wound that he had. Interestingly, Zechariah 11, 17 is the Antichrist and the deadly wound. He's going to be, his right arm is, right arm, <laughs> is going to be destroyed in his right eye. Uh, but, but the other thing is, two, uh, verses 12 and 13 above that talk about Judas, going in and betraying Christ, prophesied. So they reject Jesus Christ, but they're going to receive the Antichrist. That's back in Zechariah 11. I'll let you read that on your own. But what you have here is, is uh, the, 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 the false prophet now tells the world to create an image of the beast. 
He was wounded, and now he's alive, so let's create an image of him. And they're going to take that image, and they're going to put it in the temple, and they're going to end up worshiping that image of the beast. Now, that's I said last week, any Jewish person realizing, bow down to an image? Oh, no, that's the, God says, there shall not have any gods before me, thou shalt not bow down to any graven image. When, they, when he does that, any Jewish person who believes their Bible is going to realize that's Antichrist. That means Jesus was the Christ. And that's why I was pointing out, I believe a nation is going to be born in a day. They're finally, the eyes are going to be wide open at this point. The ones whose eyes aren't wide open, they'll end up worshiping this beast in the image. It says in verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Now I add to this, you not only have the first beast, the second beast, but now you got the image of the beast. That image of the beast, you know, we live in a day that's fascinating where they not only have robotics, or just robots were used as computers, now they make them look like people. And there's going to be an image of the beast. But watch what happens to this image of the beast. Look at verse 15 again. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and when he speaks, here's what he's going to do, and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. You know, we, we build computers, they look like men today, and they have what's called artificial intelligence. That's an amazing thing. Artificial intelligence. There's two things I want to warn you about. Kevin pointed this out to me. We went and looked it up on the internet. I, I, I know that when you watch YouTube, I don't know if these things are manipulated, but Kevin showed me a clip where two men are talking to Alexa. That's the right name where you talk to that computer. Anyhow, they asked Alexa, Alexa, who is Jesus Christ? You know what the answer was? A fictional character. So they asked, Alexa, who is Muhammad? The answer is, Muhammad uh, was uh, a prophet who walked around and taught people how to live and to worship the true God. Allah. Yeah. What do you think artificial intelligence is going to tell the world to do? Bow down to the image of the beast and worship the beast as if he was God? You know, there's something else you need to be warned about. The satanic church today is going around and starting clubs in elementary schools teaching elementary kids to worship Satan. I don't know if it was Colorado just made a bill to make it illegal. But they're doing it saying, look, freedom of religion. If you can have a Bible club, we can have our satanic club. And that's our religion. But I, I forget what state it was, made a bill saying, no, that's not a religion, to try to stop that. Because everywhere else, everyone else says, oh, yeah, I guess you do have the right, and they are doing it. They're directly opposing, trying to get into the minds and hearts of our kids to teach them about Satan and to worship Satan. Ultimately, the world is going to bow down and worship Satan. We, we're reading the verses that are telling us. And, and more than any other generation, we can see how this is going to work out. You realize... The things we read in Daniel, 600 B.C., these, the things we're reading in Revelation were 2,000 years ago. And how would this beast do all these things? How could, how could you make an image that can talk and, and make decisions? Well, to us, that's no big deal anymore. We live in a day where we see this just at the verge of happening. And that's why I believe it'll, it'll, all this will happen soon. So anyhow, verse 15 says... And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image that they should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, I like this one, rich and poor. He's going to get peons and powerful people, but also rich people and poor people. He's going to put them all in the same category. Free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. You know what's coming, don't you? And it says, And he shall cause both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Interesting, it says in, not on. A lot of times we think they're going to be able to see it. But he does say in. We don't know if it's a chip underneath your skin. But either way, it's a mark in the right hand or in their forehead and, uh, that no man might buy or sell. So he's going to take control of the money system of the world. Save he that hath the mark, and the name of the beast, and the number of his name. 
Now we're about to see what that number of his name is, but that mark that's going to be given is called three things. The mark, uh, uh, it's uh, by yourself save, he that hath the mark, it's just called the mark. Or the name of the beast. The mark represents the name of the beast. Remember the 144,000? They had the seal of God, and it was the name of God in Revelation chapter 14. That seal that's given to them, they have God's name. These people are going to have the name of the beast somehow planted in them by this mark. And it's a number as well, the number of his name. So this number represents the name of the beast, and it's the mark of the beast. And then it says, herein is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. It is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, that's sixty, and six. Six, six, six. As we come to the end of Revelation 13, the first beast is the political leader of the whole world. The second beast shows up and he becomes the spiritual leader of the whole world. We have a one world government, we have a one world religion, and the image causes everybody to receive this mark, and if you don't receive this mark, you're going to be killed, and this mark is a mark that controls the money system of this world, a one world currency. And that's where it's all heading. How, how often do you use cash anymore? They have commercials on TV that discourage you from using cash because you're holding up the line. If you just use a credit card, you can just pass through the line. Now you just tap your credit card and it's faster than inserting the credit card. Anyhow, we're just living in that time. But that mark is the number 666. Six, six. 600, 3 score, 60, and 6. Think about that number. 6, it, it says right there, it says, and the number is the number of a man. The number of man in your Bible is six, created the sixth day. Man, so six is the number of man, but it's six, 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 six three times. Three is the number of God. You know what this number represents? A man claiming to be God. And people say, okay, I'll take that mark. And when they do, we're gonna read in Revelation 14, they're damned for all eternity. Anyone who receives that mark is going to be damned. Those who don't take the mark are going to be killed, but that's the patience and faith of the saint. There's a battle between God and Satan started way back in Genesis. It's coming to a culmination in the book of Revelation, and we're seeing how it's going to all end up. I hope you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. I hope you take this Bible seriously. I don't see how any person couldn't if they just read it and see what the things are being said. And I hope you take the cross of Christ seriously. It's the only means you can be saved. What can take away your sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And he rose from the dead so he could become your savior and give you that gift of eternal life. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word. Father, we thank you for the gift of eternal life. We thank you, Father, uh, it's kind of a hard thing to say that we live in a time which the book of Revelation doesn't seem too hard to understand, which means that we're probably getting real close to the end of the world as we know it. But we're thankful that we can be a part of your eternal kingdom when your son comes and first for a thousand year reigns on earth, but we're caught into heavens to be seated with Christ in those heavenly places. Father, I pray that each person here has the good judgment to realize that you love them. You provided for them to have eternal life. You gave your son and he gave his life that he might give them eternal life. And I pray that on the basis of faith, they'll just trust that payment and receive from you that gift of eternal life. In his name we pray. Amen.